Beginning in the name of Almighty, we start the series of lectures on the forensic subject. As we all know that uh, the modular system has been ensured by the KMU and the KP. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, most of the students are not paying much attention to this subject as its contribution in the annuals or finals is very minute. So uh, these are going to be uh, short video tutorials um, based on the outcomes. Outcomes, I mean, uh, it in these include topics that have appeared in past papers and uh, past MCQs. So these are outcome-based. These are not something you should be looking for if you're interested in a clear understanding or a deep understanding of forensic subject. Now, uh, starting with thanatology, the first question that may arise in your mind is that why thanatology? Why not sections preceding thanatology? As in most of the reference books on thanatology, uh, sorry, most of the reference books on the forensic medicine uh, have uh, sections preceding thanatology. And the thing is that uh, the sections preceding thanatology in those reference books, uh, either you prefer Pari, Hornacy, Barawan, or Vivi Pele, etc., uh, those sections are uh, about laws and ethics, which have no concept at all, and you can go through them anytime you want because it's pure memorization. So let's begin. Thanatology and logi. Logi is from logos, we all know that. And logos means science or study. Thanato is a name for Greek god. It is a Greek god's name. Which Greek god? It is a god of death in Greek mythology. So thanatology is the science of death. To understand death, we must know what's life. Life is the presence and integration of three interdependent vital systems of the body. I repeat, life is the presence and integration of three interdependent systems of the body. And if your absence occurs, then that's death. Then I, now go to a, we should go to the next slide and study the text. Thanatos is, means death. It's from the Greek god. Here is him. And logos is science. So thanatology is the science of life. I'm sorry, science of death. What is life? Life is the presence and integration of three interdependent organ systems and the absence or lack of three interdependent organ systems is death. Now, all, our, and all doctors and most healthcare professionals encounter death, and during at some time in their career, it is important to have a clear understanding of the medical and legal aspects of the death. Now, what is tripod of life, or what are these three symptoms? What is a tripod? Basically, a tripod is a stand. Have you ever seen a camera stand or a selfie stand, or if you're a logger or YouTuber, then you must know this stuff. Tripod is a stand having three feet. Pod is actually for feet. So life, according to the definition, has three feet, and these three feet are three vital systems that are interdependent. Interdependent meaning that failure of even one of these leads to the failure of others. So can you help me guess these three vital systems without which we cannot live? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm hearing. The first is the CNS. And, and, yes, 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 uh, I heard you. The CVS. And both the CNS and CVS need oxygen, meaning respiratory system. So the tripod of life is CNS, CVS, and respiratory system. Now, um, advances in resuscitation techniques in recent decades, like technologies, for example, ventilation, uh, has resulted in survival of patients which would otherwise have died as a result of direct cerebral trauma or cerebral hypoxia or whatever. But artificial ventilation interrupts that process while ventilation is continued, myocardial hypoxia and cardiac arrest and cerebral hypoxia are prevented. So recently, uh, from legal point of view, death has become uh, a problematic issue. Another important point is that medically and scientifically, death is not an event, it is a process. It is a process in which cellular metabolic processes in different tissues and organs cease to function at different rates. Now, I don't think I can explain it in simpler terms. Uh, th let me repeat, it's important. Medically and scientifically, death is not an event, it is a process. That is not an event, it is a process in which cellular metabolic processes in different tissues and organs cease to function at different rates. Now, the differential rate of cellular death. 
some organs die before the others and some die later than the others. So this has given rise to a series of arguments and debates legally that as to when the death actually occurs. Like for example, if you are in ER and the patient dies and you have to uh, ensure and you have to uh, give a death certificate, then what time will you mention? So a solution to this problem is to consider the death of the single cell i.e. cellular death and the cessation of the integration of the functioning of an individual as two separate aspects. Now this whole sentence of mine is enough to cause my tripods cessate to work. So in simpler terms it means that we consider the death of the body and death of the cell two different things. The time we note legally is the death of the body and the cells continue to function for some time even after the death of the body. So let's go to the next slide and read the text. Stages of death. The first one is somatic death and second is the cellular death. Somatic death. All, it is also called clinical or systemic death. Now these terms also uh, terms are important. Uh, I have seen them appear in past MCQs of 10 doctors, so you better not miss them. Uh, so what is somatic death? It's the extension of vital functions of heart, lungs, and brain. Simple definition, simple definition of death. It's same copy-paste. Coming to the cellular death. Cellular death is also called molecular death. Organs can be functioning even after the somatic death and gradually disintegrate upon oxygen requirements. Organs gradually disintegrate depending upon oxygen requirements. Now, what does it mean that organs disintegrate gradually at different? Cellular death actually implies the cessation of respiration and the normal metabolic activity in the body tissues and cells. Cessation of respiration is soon followed by autolysis and decay of the cells. The rate at which the point that I was actually trying to make was that rate at which the cells die are not simultaneous unless there is certain disastrous event like for example Chernobyl if it ever occurs in your colony, I hope not and I pray not, but uh, such uh, uh, disastrous events like nuclear explosion uh, can make your all cells die simultaneously. Other than that cells disintegrate at different rates. Now why are we so focused about disintegration at different rates and is it even important? As I mentioned, is it even important? Yes, it is important. For what purpose? For, can you guess? Think, think, think. You don't have to mention these uh, timings in legal report, then um, it must have some medical significance. And yes, uh, it is used for organ transplantation. For organ transplantation, uh, through a cadaveric donation, cadaver means dead body. If a dead body has will to donate his organs, then the organs must be taken after the somatic death, i.e. death of the body, and prior to the cellular death, i.e. death of the specific organ um, that the person has willed to donate. If uh, timing, if uh, the procedure is delayed, then this may cause a death of the tissue and the will will not be fulfilled. So for cornea, cornea remains viable for six hours. You can transplant cornea from a cadaver into a living up to six hours after the somatic death. Kidney can be tra transplanted up to 45 minutes, heart one hour, liver 15 minutes. Now are these values important? Yes, these are important. They have appeared in past uh, MCQs. I have seen them. And uh, neurons. Neurons we know are most susceptible to hypoxia. So if uh, they don't receive oxygen supply for three to seven minutes, uh, they die. So unless you transplant a brain in seconds after death, this cannot occur. And uh, well, are you noticing something? What does this HTA mean? Why did I bother mention it here? HTA is actually human tissue act. And it's quite simple. So I did not uh, write it in detail for here for you guys. It is simply two points. Well, some books I mentioned in detail, but uh, I don't think it's important. Never occurred in past papers. If a person is alive, he can make his will for donation of his organs. That's the first point. That if a person is alive, he can make the will for donation of his organs. And if a person is dead, then the custodians are responsible for such a step. Let me repeat. If a person is alive, he can make his or her will for donation of his organ, his or her organs. And if a person is, is dead, the custodians can make such a decision. So that's all about the Human Tissue Act. Now, 
legally and medically speaking, consider yourself in an ER and the person dies, how will you diagnose death? So, in all this discussion of thanatology, we gave much importance to the tripod of life, the three systems on which the life stands. So you gotta check the cessation of activities of these three systems to confirm that the patient has died. So let's go to the next slide and read the text. Diagnosis and confirmation of death. It's based on three on the same tripod of life. Think this cardiac functions, extension of cardiac functions, respiration, and brain functions. There are different tests for each of uh, these which uh, a medical practitioner needs to perform uh, in order to uh, diagnose a death. Uh, I missed some points uh, about the somatic death, so let me uh, take it from here. Somatic death means that the individual will never again communicate or deliberately interact with the environment. Somatic death means that the individual will never again communicate or deliberately interact with the environment. The individual is irreversibly unconscious and in, un, unaware. The individual is irreversibly unconscious and unaware of both the world and their own existence. The key element in this definition that I just made is irreversible. Uh, the definition was the individual is irreversibly unconscious and unaware of both the world and their own existence. And then I mentioned that the key element in this definition is irreversible, as lack of communication and interaction with the environment may occur in a variety of settings, such as when in a deep sleep, under anesthesia, or under the influence of sedatives, or as a result of temporary coma due to head injury, or whatever may be the cause. So going again to diagnosis and confirmation of death. The first bullet point I mentioned relates to cardiac functions. So how are you going to assess the cardiac functions? Well, the tests are simple. You will go from low yield to high yield. And uh, I don't think you will ever need to go through them again. The first test is to check the pulse. Pulselessness is surely a sign of death. Second step or second test that you can uh, that you can do is the auscultation over the chest, interior chest wall, and there will be absence of heard sounds if the person is dead. The third test is heat test. Heat test meaning that if you heat a certain portion of the body, the true blisters will not form because blister formation uh, is an inflammatory event. Inflammatory event, as you have just studied in your pathology, inflammation requires uh, inflammatory cells, their migration, cytokines, transmigration, diabetes, rolling, margination, etc. All that shit. Since the person is dead, that cannot occur. So how can true blister form after you hit a certain part of him or her? And uh, there are two more important tests. Oh, uh, I think we should move on to the next slide. These are signs of cardiac functions. We have gone through pulselessness, heat test, absent heart sound. What is an artery incision test? As the name suggests, you incise an artery. After you incise an artery in a living, the blood that oozes out, it oozes out in pulsatile fashion because uh, the blood in artery is under constant pressure from the pumping of heart. In, the, uh, in, the, in a death, uh, in dead individual, and there is no pumping, so how can the blood ooze out in a pulsatile fashion? So these were obsolete tests, rarely used now. These two are what you should uh, clearly know. What's a Magnus test? Magnus test is simple. Now the name is different. The name might be difficult. Of you, if you remember the name, then you're good with it. What is that? What do you think it is? Hmm? It doesn't seem like it, but it's a finger. Don't laugh. Stop laughing. Stop laughing at my grind. It's a finger. And what's that? It's a ligature. So all you have to do in Magnus test is to apply a ligature to the finger. So what will happen? When ligature is applied to finger to occlude the venous return, if circulation is present, the distal part of the finger will become pale. The distal part of the finger will become pale, while the proximal part will remain pinkish to red. And if the circulation is absent, then you cannot observe this color change. 
The other test is diaphanous test, but I think this slide has become very busy with all these colorations, so I think we should move on to the next slide and explain the diaphanous there. What's a diaphanous test? Uh, I think before knowing the diaphanous test, you should know what is a finger web. You see these areas? These are called finger webs. So, diaphanous test is uh, simple. Uh, just like magnus test, all you need to do is to remember the name. Diaphanous test uh, is based on the principle that the finger web appears translucent red or pinkish against the light. That if you hold the hand of the patient, or rather I should say the dead body, and transilluminate it. Transilluminate means ek side se light dalen, dusri side se dekhe. Yes, it's the simplest definition. So the finger webs will uh, should appear pinkish to red in a living individual. But uh, in a cadaver, they will appear opaque yellow. And uh, this refers to that there is no circulation. These were all the tests for the monitoring uh, for cardiac function. Now next comes the uh, respiratory tests for confirmation of respiratory failure. These are simple. So let's go to the next slide. Signs of cessation of respiration. The first test is the mirror test. What is a mirror test? It's a piece of cake. Hold a mirror in front of the nostrils or open mouth of the uh, cadaver or the suspected case. Due to moisture in breath, the mirror has to become dim. And if mirror does not turn dim, this means there is no uh, respiration occurring. What's a feather test? It's also simple. Hold a feather or uh, sorry, hold a feather or a very light object in front of nostrils or open mouth and it should move with breath and if it does not then uh, there is no respiration and the next is auscultation auscult the chest and larynx for any sounds of uh, ear passage now what's a candle test and wind slope water test these two sound a little sophisticated to me i don't know whether they sound sophisticated to you or not but uh, candle test mein kya hota hai aap shama leke simple is kahiye shama leke jo aapke paas body aayi hai uske seene pe rakh dete hain anterior chest wall pe agar body saans le rahi hai to uske jo nostril se hawa niklegi wo candle ke flame ki direction ko change karegi agar change nahi kar rahi iska matlab hai ke saans nahi le raha banda and winslow's glass water test means ke एक प्लेट लें सिंपल ये प्लेट लें उसमें कोई बर्तन रख दें पानी का और वो प्लेट जाके जो बॉडी आपके पास आई है उसके चेस्ट पे वो प्लेट रख दें अगर वो बंदा सांस ले रहा है तो उसके एबडोम और चेस्ट वॉल मूव करेगी जिसकी वजह से वाटर लेवल चेंज होगा उसमें रिपल्स आएंगे अगर ऐसा नहीं हो रहा तो इसका मतलब है कि रिस्पायरेशन नहीं हो रही बहरहाल ये सारे टेस्ट अब सोलीट हैं ज़्यादा यूज़ नहीं होता है इनका और नहीं हम पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से इंपॉर्टेंट है इसमें जो मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट टेस्ट है जिसको मैंने सबसे ज़्यादा बड़ा लिखा है वो है इंस्पेक्शन इंस्पेक्शन का क्या मतलब है इंस्पेक्शन का मतलब इंस्पेक्ट करें केयरफुली इंस्पेक्ट दी चेस्ट फॉर चेस्ट एंड एबडोमिनल मूवमेंट्स दैट इज द बेस्ट टेस्ट यू कैन यूज फॉर कंफर्मिंग दी सेशन ऑफ रेस्पाइवेशन एंड नेक्स्ट और बाकी नेक्स्ट वीडियो में इनशाला